in communion. Get communion out of the way out there. I mean, uh, celebrate communion on top of that. Amen. Amen. Shall we begin? Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringing instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Come on somebody and bless the Lord this morning. Amen. Anybody got a praise left in you this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says, oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. For the Lord thy God is great, and the Lord thy God is terrible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 If you have your Bible this morning, and I hope that you do, I wish that you would navigate your way to the book of Lamentations 3. 21 through 24. The Lamentations of Jeremiah, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's um, between Jeremiah and Ezekiel, somewhere right up in that area. Lamentations 3, 21 through 24. And I want to preach on this thought this morning. Brother Tim, if you'll flash it up there. God is too faithful to fail. God is too faithful to fail. How many of you believe that God is too faithful to fail? How many of you believe that God is incapable of failure? Amen, amen, amen. Go back to that scripture, Brother Timmy. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. There's your phone, somebody. There it is, you pinged it, there it is. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Somebody needs to hear that this morning. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. 23. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, Therefore, will I hope in him. 23 again, please. Father, once again I come into your divine presence. I need your anointing. I need your power. In my own strength I get up here and I'm timid. Not a lot of courage. Not a lot of strength. So to Heavenly Father, we pray God you'll give courage to my cowardness, and to my timidity. Lord Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, give wisdom to my human ignorance. I don't want to give them the ways and the philosophies of the world. I want to give them the, the, the power of the Word of God, the Heavenly Father. From the top of their heads to the soles of their feet, God, I pray that you'll give them a listening ear. And that God, when that, when that, when that Word goes into their natural ear, and I pray to go into their spiritual ear. In order to make a difference in their lives from the top of their heads with the sole of their feet once again. Let me not say anything but the Father, the name of the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. And once again, let this word be the ink and let my tongue be that of a ready writer that I might write and stain the word of God upon the tables of their hearts that they might not sin against God all the days of their life. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. The book of Lamentations, people shy away from because it is very, very powerful Hebrew poetry. Uh, the best poetry in the history of the world is Hebrew poetry. In school, they put up the Quran beside the King James Version of the Bible or, or, or a version of the Bible. And it was like reading kindergarten writing versus collegiate writing. Hebrew poetry is the best. 
in the world. This uh, particular composition of poetry is fleshed out by one of the greatest prophets they ever trod upon the face of the earth, and his name was Jeremiah, also called the weeping prophet. The word lament, lamentations, the word lament means to pour out grief. It means to weep. It means to cry bitterly. It means to mourn and to sob. So to understand really what Jeremiah is writing about, composing his poetry about, you really need to understand the context of the scripture. Amen? Remember, scripture cannot say what it has not said. Amen? The scripture is not to be added to or taken away from. Therefore, to have a good grasp, a good uh, understanding of what Jeremiah is saying, you need to understand that the destruction of Jerusalem is taking place and Israel has been taken captive by the Babylonians. Uh, both Jeremiah and Ezekiel existed during these times. And years and years of prophesying and preaching and toiling has come to futility. The, 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 the gates are being burned down. Yes, these are the same gates that Nehemiah will rebuild at a later time. Remember, the Bible is not in chronological order. The gates of the city are being burned down. The city will soon be in ruins. Lives are taken. Homes are destroyed. People are in chaos. They're being made slaves and captives. And you get the picture. It's just, a, it's just a, a, if you just go back and read that whole entire chapter, total chaos everywhere you look. But somehow, Miss Donna, some way, Jeremiah is able to rise up in the midst of his struggle. How many of you know struggle produces strength? Struggle produces your personal poetry. Sometimes you got to look to your past to know where you're at and to know where you're going in your future because God is faithful. Come on, somebody. In the midst of all this anguish comes a beautiful masterpiece. Can I, can, I, can I say that again? Some of you are going through a crisis. You're going through pain. You're going through suffering. But can I tell you, out of your suffering rises God's masterpiece in your life. How, how many believe God is making a masterpiece out of your crisis? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The weeping the prophet declares this. This I recall to my mind. In verse number, I believe that's verse number 21. Go there, Brother Timmy, real quick. He says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have, have I hope. This is what Jeremiah is saying. I know things around me don't look well, but things have not looked well for me in the past. I recall to my mind like David. David said, I can overcome this giant. Because God helped me overcome the bear and the lion. Sometimes you got to look to your past to get, pre to get present strength. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you got to remember what God has done for you all of your life and know that God does not change. He's immutable. He's unchangeable. Come on, somebody. Give God one more praise. As a matter of fact, faithfulness. Go back to our, 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 our scripture, Brother Timmy. Go back to verse 23. Great is thy faithfulness. Faithfulness means steadfast. It means staunch. It means unchanging. It means unwavering. Loyal. You are an allegiant person. You're trustworthy. And most importantly, you are dependable. So Jeremiah is saying, don't worry, God is steadfast. Don't worry, God is staunch. Don't worry, God is unwavering. God is loyal in his character. God is loyal in his integrity. God is an allegiant God. He's trustworthy and he is dependable. How many of you know God is dependable? I believe Jeremiah is saying that God is faithful and can be dependent upon because, because he's never lost a battle. Can I tell you this morning, God has never lost a battle. He is one trillion and oh. He is trillions upon trillions upon trillions and oh. If God has never lost a battle, he's never going to lose a battle. Therefore, your enemies become his enemies. And to those that are for you, God is for them because God is loyal. God is trustworthy. Hey, glory, God is faithful. 
David said he's faithful to a thousand generations. In other words, not only is God faithful today, but God is faithful every day, every morning, every evening, every night, while you're sleeping, while you're eating, while you're awake. Come on, somebody, have you know God is faithful? He is perfect in the win column, but no losses. He is undefeatable. He is unchangeable. He cannot be overcome. Come on, somebody. He cannot be forced out of the world he created. No philosophy of man can outsmart him. No army or principality can overthrow him. No circumstance in your life is too big for God to overcome. Do we have anybody here today that believes that God is faithful? J.W., his kingdom is unconquerable. No antichrist army can defeat him because he's faithful. He's going to live. He's going to thrive. He's going to exist. And he's going to make a difference in your circumstance. You just need to hold on, weary Christian, because God is faithful. His people cannot be stamped out. Jesus Christ said this. He said the gates of hell itself will come against the church. But he said no, nobody can over. The gates of hell will not come and prevail against the church. Listen, he said the gates of hell will try to prevail. Didn't he? You know what that means? The gates of hell is going to be open. Satan's going to be loose. Beelzebub's going to be loose. All the demons in hell is going to be loose. The very gates of hell itself is going to open. All the foul creatures crapped in the abyss is going to come against this church. But he said, I am faithful, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. I don't know who I'm talking up into up in here today or out there in, 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 in the world of tech, but I'm telling you, you need to understand that God is not going to forsake you. God is not going to leave you. God is loyal. God is strong. God is mighty. And no, none of your circumstances in your life can overcome and dethrone his power in your life. <laughs> Jeremiah, so you got to understand, I'm recalled. Sometimes you've got to force your mind to say, my God is unchangeable. Nobody can overthrow him. This circumstance I'm going through, God is going to be faithful. What's that song say? He did it back in those days. He's going to do it again. How many of you like that new contemporary song? I forget the name of it. Somebody blurted it out. It talks about, didn't he do it? Yes, he can. Amen. Didn't he move the mountains? And he can still do it. How many believe God can still move mountains in your life? Listen, his word is unchallenged. They try to throw him out of these colleges. They try to throw him out of Congress. But when they don't understand if God wants it, he can throw them out of there. Come on, somebody. I want to pour two principles in you. I'm going to try not to preach too awful long this morning. Some of y'all say, I don't know if you can do that. We'll try. We'll try. Hallelujah. You need to understand two things in your life that God wants to be faithful to you. I want you to remember again that nothing can overthrow the power of God in your life. I want you to recall, some of you would have been crazy today if God hadn't come to your aid many years ago. How many of you believe right now you'd be in a nut house somewhere if God hadn't touched you in your life? Or in the grave somewhere even. Let's be honest, some of you wouldn't even got up out of bed this morning if you didn't know that God is faithful. Somebody give God one more shout of praise before we go any further. So there's two principles you need to understand about God's faithfulness. Number one, God is always faithful to his word. And number two, God is always faithful to forgive our sin and our failures. So number two, God is faithful to forgive our sins and failures. And number one, God is always faithful to his word. The word of God is his character. The word of God, remember he said, I, I, I need to swear to Abraham. I thought the Bible said you can't swear, but God can swear if he wants to. Now, we, we, you know what I'm talking about. When I say the word swear, I mean uh, covet. God says, I need to find some kind of way to tell Abraham that I'm going to be with him so he won't worry. I'm going to be faithful. I'm dependable. I'm loyal. I can't swear by this. So I'm going to swear by my word. And I'm going to swear by my name. I've always been encapsulated or 
captured my imagination description of the word of God. It's not, on, it's not on my itinerary, Brother Timmy. He said the word of God is above all his names. I thought about that one day. The Bible says at his name every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. At the word of God, the world's. I mean, just, just by the name of Jesus, the Bible said the worlds were created. The Bible said all the power of heaven and earth was invested into the name of Jesus. The power of Saturn, the power of the heavens, the power of the earth, and all the power of the oceans were invested into the name of Jesus. Jesus said, if these signs, these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name you'll cast out demons. In my name you'll speak with new tongues. In my name, hallelujah. You lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Yet the Bible says that the word of God is above all his name. That's how powerful God's word is. In other words, God said, because I'm a, God is faithful in nature. He's not, he's, some of you just worry all the time about God leaving you, coming back, God leaving you. Where do you think we had kindergarten? I'm glad that God is not the God how we view him. And I'm glad that we are not how God views us. Can I get a witness there? Isaiah 55, 10 through 12 says this. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. How many of you have been enjoying that little bit of snow we've been having? And returneth not thither, but worth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, Bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. This, this is what God is trying to tell you this morning. Because I'm faithful, the word that I speak is faithful. Because I'm omnipotent, when I speak my word, my word is the same essence, the same substance of who I am. So when I speak my word, it's got clout. When I speak my word, it's got power. He said, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So number one, go back to verse number 10. God's word, everything God's word touches becomes fruitful and brings increase. Theologically, I've always taught you that God did not create you because he needed worship. God is not Zeus. He's not some Greek God that is dependent upon his existence whether you pray or don't pray. Whether you pray or don't pray, God is immutable. God is unchangeable. He's not going to change. That's why whether the world believes or not, God is faithful. He's the same. He's immutable. He's unchangeable. Can I get a witness? If the world never believed again, if never one person ever believed in the whole entire existence of our world again, it's not going to change God or change God or who he is. That's why you can pat with God, be mad with God, but God's going to keep spinning the earth. God's going to keep spinning the moon. God's going to keep spinning the universe. Can I get a witness there? God's going to keep on being God. Everything God's word touches becomes fruitful and brings increase. You are created because God wanted to express his creative nature. That's why you're created. You are created out of love. God said, I have all this life between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is love. It's like a musician. You hear all these notes in your head. You hear all these songs in your heart. How can I express them? I picked up the harmonica. I picked up the guitar. I played the percussions. I played the stringing instruments. Or a singer. I have this talent that God has laid inside of me, and I need to express that talent. How can I express this talent? Well, I need a song to sing, right? A singer, right? So God has all this talent, all this life inside of him. How can I express my talent? I know. I'll express it through a universe. I'll express it through love. And I'm going to make a man in my image. This is what I'm trying to teach you this morning. Because God is full of life, 
Because God is full of miracles. Because God is full of eternity. When he speaks, it's the essence of who he is. So everything God's word touches is fruitful and it brings life. Let me tell you, I don't care how dead your situation might seem. You are one word away from your miracle. Your financial miracle is just one word away. Your prodigal son is just one word away from coming home. Your prodigal daughter is only one word away from coming home. You're just, you're just one word away. I bet they can hear that, didn't Shannon? Hallelujah. Might make the rest of them in here blink. I give bread to the eater through my word. I give seed to the sower through my word. I make the earth bud through my word. I water the earth through my word. Come on, somebody. Verse number 11 again. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. Void means empty. In other words, God said, whenever I speak the word, when it comes back, it better have a testimony. Got to make you shout. Somebody, come on, somebody shout to the Lord. How many believe that God is faithful and God's word is true and God's word is real? No, but when I, when I send you out, I'm putting purpose in you. When you get a word from God, it's always got purpose. It's, listen, when God says a word to you, it's always impregnated with everything it needs to be success, successful in your life. We always, we always say God's word is like a seed. He said that in verse number 10, didn't he? I've always thought the acorn, I said acorn. Some people say acorn, but she used to say acorn. Everything it needs is inside of it to be a mighty live oak tree. The root system is in that little acorn. I'm from this country. No matter how smart I get, or how, well, I'm not very smart, but no matter how much college I get, I'm still a country kid. Everything, the leaves, everything it needs to be successful is wrapped up in that seed. All a squirrel's got to do is drop that seed on the ground and mash it into the earth, and a couple years later, you got a live oak tree somewhere in the forest. God says, so shall my word be to go forth out of my mouth. It is impregnated with life because I'm full of life. Glory to God. It is impregnated with an unconquerable force. Because I'm unconquerable. My word is unconquerable. Don't worry about them coming against the word of God. They can't overthrow it. Come on, somebody. It's full of life. It's full of power. In other words, God, you need a miracle in your life. God said, I'm going to speak a word, and I'm going to breathe life into this word. That's why Jesus became the living, breathing, walking word of God. And the word of God became flesh and dwelt among men. I don't care how long ago God gave you a word. God is faithful to his word. But it shall accomplish. God's word always serves its purpose. We will always be a biblically-based church because of that. What's our number one core value? It's in the vestibule out there. It's in your hand that I gave you this morning, Sister Louise. The Scriptures always has preeminence and authority over everything we do. Can I get a witness there? Listen, God's Word doesn't barely get the job done. Let me say that again. God's word doesn't barely get the job done. Some of y'all, y'all heard so much preaching. You've read the word of God. You're immune to the power of the How many people get healed around here? Through speaking the word. Have you ever noticed that, that God never thought the world into existence? And God said, let there be light. And God said. Let there be this. God said, let there be light. God spoke. There is power in the spoken word. Let me tell you something. Once God's word releases from his lips, 
that word will be full of power no matter where it's at. Somewhere in the universe, I just spoke these scriptures. It's going to go, and it's going to go, and it's gonna, it cannot return void unto him, but it will accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing wherein I sent it. God wants to prosper. God's word always succeeds, and God's word always fulfills, and God's word always prospers. I want you to listen, listen to me closely. When you listen, when you speak or listen to God's word, we blast it through our house every day. Every day we blast the scripture through our house. Some kind of preacher, some kind of song, some kind of Bible, something blasting through our house all the time. It wants to, it's a lie. You understand? Jesus said, in my word is spirit and life. Whenever you sit down in the morning, you're not just reading some cute little devotional to help me get, you are ingesting a living, breathing word. It's not an organization. It is a living, breathing organism. Come on, somebody. And when you read it, it impregnates you with power. I like to carry a good scripture with me everywhere I go. First Kings. 856. That's why I only gave you two points. Right? Blessed be the God that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he hath promised. Watch this. Here's the phrase I want to get right here. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise. There hath not failed one word one but has never failed from God's word. No verse has ever failed in God's word. When God speaks it, it will not fail. Come on, somebody. When God speaks the word to you, it cannot fail. It will not fail. <laughs> Which he promised by the hand of, his Moses, of Moses, his servant. Brother Timmy, our scripture we talked about earlier. Numbers 23, 19. You need to see this for your own two eyes. God is not a man that he should lie. God is incapable of several things. God is incapable of failure. God is incapable of worship. God cannot worship. I've taught you that many, many times. God cannot worship. That's right. God don't worship celebrities. God don't, God, he don't worship our government. God don't worship you. Some of y'all have said, what? No. To worship something means you've got to bow before it. God don't bow before nobody because God's at the top. Come on, somebody. He can only be worshipped. And God can not lie. He cannot lie. Neither the Son of Man that he should repent hath he said, and shall he not do it. In other words, if God said it, he will do it. If God said, I'm going to come back in the clouds on a white horse, then he's going to come back on a cloud on a white horse. If God says one day I'm going to catch my church up out of this world and it's going to be a rapture, then one day you can look up to heaven to the east because he's going to come because he's a man that can not lie. If he says he's going to call your prodigal son home, he's going to do it because he cannot lie. Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Remember, remember, remember what Isaiah just got done telling you. He said, my word would not return to me void. If I speak it in your life, it's going to germinate. It's like a seed. It's, gonna, it's, it's, it's impregnated with life, and it's going to produce the fruit, and it's going to produce the harvest. So how many of you want to clap your hand to give God some praise because God is faithful to his word? that apply to your everyday life? This is good for Jeremiah. This is good for Isaiah. But how about me? When you read the word of God, it's just as relevant and legitimate as the day it was written in the, in the original canonical scriptures. It's just as relevant right now. People don't change. And God's word don't change. Is it? I, I know I go to here all the time. I got to go to here again. I get asked this question all the time. Are the Ten Commandments still relevant for today? I say, is it still a sin to murder? Yeah. Is it still a sin to lie? Yeah. Is it still a sin to commit adultery? Yeah. The point is that 
people don't change and neither does God's word. Therefore, God's word is relevant for every generation. All sin can be traced back to three entities. Money, lust, and power. Money, lust. If you're in here today and you call up in a sin, I encourage you to repent. We're about to do communion here a little shortly. Money, lust, and power. Mm-hmm. Now, speaking of sins, God is faithful to forgive our sins and our failures. So number one, God is faithful to his word. Number two, God is faithful to forgive our sins and our failures. 1 John 8 and 9. 1 John 8 and 9. Now this is going to rock some of y'all's uh, pharisaical boat here now. I know we got some Pharisees up in here this morning. Somebody listening somewhere that thinks they're perfect. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Stop right there. If we say we have no sin, it goes on later to call you a liar. A man say he hath no sin is a liar. Now, I know pastors are pre that preach that to you. I, I, I know preachers say, I don't have no sin in my life. I, I ain't had no sin in my life for weeks. I, I get away from it. Because as long as you're in this body, you're going to have failure. Can I get away with you? You're going to sin. You're going to fall short. Now, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So, John is saying that sometimes, not all the time, I'm not giving you a free ticket to go out and sin. What I am telling you is, obviously, we can have sins inside. Now, I like to classify sins in two categories, conscious sins and unconscious sins. Now, you, you can debate me. It's okay for you to be wrong. It's okay. It's okay. Everybody's wrong sometimes. Everybody's wrong sometimes. So you know what a conscious sin is. That's the big boys. In the Catholic world, Bill, it's the big ones, right? The cardinals. Right? Then they got the medial sins. Then the cardinals, the big boys, lie, murder, cheat. Steal, gambling. I ain't got time to get on all of that. Then you got what they call the, the menial sins, right? The little, the, little, the little smaller things, you know. So, conscious sins are sins that you know you're not supposed to do. What's an unconscious sin? An unconscious sin is an unrepentant sin that you have sinned this sin for so long that you don't even feel conviction about it no more. I mean, in other words, you lie so much that whenever you lie, you can't even tell you lie. You believe the lie now. Huh? Sometimes I catch myself telling a story from back in my BC days, my before Christ days, I'm going to say, wait a minute. Was that bath really that good? Or was that bath really? Was it a hundred crappy I caught that day? Or was it two? This is what I'm trying to say. Some people can sin a sin so much. Now, I'm going to go here. You might not like me. You, you still going to love me? You sure don't shake your head? Yeah, yeah, now. You, you, might, you might not like me. You might get up and go when I say this. That's why some people can watch movies full of cussing, full of taking the Lord's name in vain. I mean, I mean, just bloated. And they just look right on. You know why? Because that stuff is so embedded in their mind, it don't bother them. It don't bother them. That's an unconscious sin. You can sit there and look somebody take the Lord's name in vain. You just keep right on watching. I'm going to tell you right now. If I'm watching a movie and somebody says, GD, I don't care how the movie ends. It's getting turned off. I don't care if I paid $80 to watch that movie. I don't care if I go on pay-per-view and, and, and order a, a $100 fight. If somebody gets on there and blesses you the name of my Lord, I'm going to cut that thing I'll eat $80. Can I get a witness? A mail the nine. -er. I done, got, I done got some of your sandbox. I done got your sandbox with you. Now somebody said, get out of my sandbox. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, tell that preacher to get out of my sandbox. Huh? Yeah. Some of y'all shout and rejoice I get in your sandbox. You don't like it no more. Well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, let me move on. Some of y'all getting impatient. Don't be impatient with me. You got to come back tonight. You got the whole evening off. The whole evening off. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse number nine. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Somebody better give God some precious your hope right there. That's your hope right there. Please, please allow me, please allow me to, to, to guide you through the scripture 
then I promise you we'll get ready to close it up. All kind of restaurants is popping up in your mind right now. Hallelujah. One of the greatest struggles in the body of Christ is receiving the forgiveness of sins from God once we have repented. That's one of the greatest battles somebody can go through. Many Christians are living defeated lives because they are hanging on to their past. In other words, they see their sins more than they see the solution to their sins. That is Jesus Christ. In other words, you repented for that sin, but when you think about the guilt of that sin still weighs on you. When God forgives you, you are forgiven. If you confess your sin, in other words, you speak your sins out. Just like God's word had to be spoken, sometimes it's good to speak out your sins. That's why you need to have a prayer closet. Quality praying is quality repenting. You need quality repenting in your life. It cleanses the soul. Matter of fact, while we're talking about this, some of y'all, we're about to partake of communion. You need to begin to clear your mind right now. You need to begin to digest this word that your preacher's giving you this morning. I haven't taught you anything heretical or anything out God's word, no matter how bad your toe hurts. We're in this. Can I get a witness there? If you're not careful, you'll enter into a futile place in your prayer closet that I call depression trail. You're so enamored and you're so caught up in your failures, you can't pray. You can't pray for your pastor. You can't pray for your children. You can't, and I'm talking to somebody, you can't pray for your church family. You can't pray for your wife. You can't pray for your children because it's always, oh, God, forgive me for 10 years ago because I, I said a bad word. God, please forgive me for 10 years ago. I brought a lot of repentance. God, please forgive me. 10 years ago I did this, and, and last week I did that, and I'm just asking your forgiveness. You need to understand that God is faithful to forgive you. Can I get a witness? God is faithful to forgive you. You repent, confess your sin, but you still feel the guilt of that sin. Let me tell you, you will never, I promise you as your pastor, you listen to me. You will never be a productive, intercessory person of prayer until you learn to ask forgiveness for your sin and move on in your life. Brother Mario, sometimes we talk about this one. He is faithful to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So why do you need to be forgiven and cleansed? You ever thought about that? Forgiven and cleansed. We like to talk about it like I'm like I'm at Yucatan. Huh? How many of you ever eat at Yucatan? It's not a sin to go to Yucatan. You, 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 yeah, you can go get a mocha taco. It's good that way. You eat it, Miss Louise, and you spill that white cheese on your shirt. That stuff don't come out easy, does it? Or the mustard. Eat, eat, eat one of Pastor Ronnie's smash onion smash burgers. get on your shirt, and you wash it. Well, the mustard itself is gone, but the stain is still there. So you kind of forgiven the shirt in a sense. You know what I'm trying to say? It's, 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 the, the actual mustard is not there, but the stain is still there. See, God, we do the same thing we repent. God forgives us, but the stain is still there. So God, I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to cleanse the sin. I'm going to put some shout on it. I'm going to put some OxyClean on it. Hey, glory, shout all over the house. Come on, somebody, give God some. Boy, if I've been preaching this up under a tent, I don't know how y'all sit. Obviously, you, you can't defeat me when I'm here with you. There ain't, ain't no way. You be popping like popcorn out there. Now, not only am I going to forgive your sin, Miss Kay, I'm going to cleanse it. You look around, it ain't Where'd it go? It ain't even there. Let me go. I haven't lost you now. How many of you truly believe that God is faithful? Then why do you doubt his word? How many of you, how many of you were here today? You said, Pastor Ron, I'm going to come to the church and I'm going to set up communion. And I said, no, you're not. You're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. No, you're not. I said, no, I'm not. I said, somebody might get your faith fired up. That's like basically calling a male liar, ain't it? 
How you think Brother, Brother Laverne would feel to see a pastor run out? I, I give you my word. I'm going to go in there and cut everyone in the ceiling fans on. I said, no, you won't. You won't do it. I don't believe you. Pastor Ron, I've never lied to you before. I don't believe you're going to do it. How many of you like your word to be doubted? That would be like, that'd be like me, Mr. Ron, I'd rather you come preach on Wednesday night. I ain't, I'm going to be here, by the way. Don't get nervous. I'm, I, I'm going to be here. But I, I don't really believe you'll be here. I believe you're lying to me. I'll be there, Pastor Ronnie. I hate to be on the end of that stick, boy. How many times has God said that to us? Are you calling me a liar? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I believe God looks at us sometimes, sometimes like that and says, you calling me a liar? You're down here asking God, you asking asking me to forgive you for something you did last week. I done told you. I forgave you for that. Why are you are you calling me a liar? I believe it hurts him. You don't you don't you, you don't think I had the power to cleanse that sin? You don't believe I had the power to lift that stain out of your life? Let me give you two scriptures and I'll close. We're just gonna read them. Micah seven nineteen. Come on back musicians. Come on back musicians. Micah 7, 19, 7, 18, excuse me, 7, 18. I'm sorry, Timmy. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? You know what pardon means, don't you? You're set free. If someone's on death row, the governor of our state can step in right when they're about to put the needle in that guy's arm and say, stop, I'm going to pardon that guy. But he messed up. I'm telling you, let the boy go. Unstrap him. And let it go, I'm going to pardon him. I know you did wrong, but I'm still going to forgive you. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? Mr. Dollar, I like this, Mr. Dollar. Read, read this with me. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in his mercy. Some of y'all still think God's anger with y'all over something you repented of five and ten years ago. You messed up, man. Get up and shake the dust off your boots. Come on, somebody. Well, we always tell you failure is not falling down. Failure is falling down and staying down when you can get back up again. I need some folk to get back up again in here today. Are y'all about to go to sleep or are you listening to me? Verse number 19. He will turn again. Notice when we mess up and we repent, God says, I'll turn again. I'll turn back to you. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquity. Subdue means to stop it in its tracks. And that will cast their sins into the depths of the sea. How many of you believe that God cast your sins in the depths of the sea? Why would the Hebrew writer say that? Why would the Hebrew writer say that? Because they couldn't tell how deep the ocean was. They didn't have fathoms. They didn't have lasers. And they didn't have things that could measure the ocean on the bottom floor. So they thought they thought there was no bottom. That's why they say the Lord is like the heavens, because there is no end to the heavens. He says, I will cast your sin. Brother Don used to say this. Brother Don Collins, he used to say, the Lord will cast your sin and the sea of forgetfulness and put up a sign that said, no fishing. <laughs> why do we fish those sins back out of our heart? When God is plainly telling you, I am faithful to your sin. I am faithful to forgive you. I gave my, the proof is if I gave my life. Brother Timmy, go back to Lamentations 3.23. Some of y'all need to hear this and we're going to have prayer. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Brother J.W., every morning ends the night. Every day when you wake up, you should breathe into free air. The night's over. The long, dark night is over. Every morning brings a new day. Every morning brings a new provision for the new day. Every morning brings new forgiveness for new sins. Every morning brings new strength for new temptations, duties, and trials. Y'all place a song of invitation for me. Are you ready? I want everybody that would to come to this altar and pray just for a few moments. God is too faithful to fail. Come on. Everybody that would just for a few moments. You ain't got to come back tonight. You got time. I thought of number Pastor Ronnie, I need to pray. I need to see God.